Tom Moran is a Pittsburgh-based musician who has been playing and performing for over four decades, starting with his roots in blues and rock and roll, to punk rock in the 70s and 80s, bluegrass music in the 90s, and in the 21st century has turned his attention to the music of Africa, the Middle East, and India. He is an accomplished player and builder of the guitar, banjo, mandolin, sitar, and oud. He continuously pushes boundaries, creating traditional fusion and experimental pieces based on an intense study of music theory, culture, and history, from the mountains of Appalachia to the sands of the Sahara. This film is a tribute to my friend Tom, his creativity, generosity, inquisitive nature, and his generous gift of music, and his punk rock attitude. hair and these like blue like, little granny Roger McGuinn glasses on and I was transfixed and it was like the the voice of God spoke to me it was like getting hit by a lightning bolt saying this is what you're going to do for the rest of your life so I had this guitar in the basement which my dad bought off of a drunk in Erie it was a harmony four-string tenor guitar. Next morning, me and my little friends got together. I got this guitar. One friend had a snare drum. My other friend had, he had an ashtray stand, which he hit with a piece of wood. And we tried playing Come Together by the Beatles. And that was like my first, sort of my first band. punk rock. Uh, I was in a band called The Five and prior to that a band called The Dark. So I guess in a way it was like one of the old grandpappies of uh, the Pittsburgh punk rock scene. One of the last men standing as it were. We moved to Boston in the early 80s. I moved back late 80s um, and I really didn't want to go back and play in punk rock 
I mean, by that time, there's like a lot of people doing it. So I didn't play for a while. And Stephanie and I, we were living in this old, H.J. Hines' old mansion down in Homewood. Well, think before you way back on Red Pittsburgh was a hot music scene. Um, I started out going to bluegrass shows, that were bluegrass shows a couple every night. And in a strange set of circumstances and coincidences, I ended up uh, at some of the punk shows. I loved the music and I loved the scene. I looked around and it was like I was looking in a mirror because there was this sort of same lost, forlorn, um, artist kind of look on people's faces. It was sort of a hungry look on people's faces too. I met Tom at a show at the Lion Walk and uh, saw his band. I believe he had the dark at that time and was very captivated by him and his playing and his appearance. And we sort of became friends during that time and then um, I also played some music in a band called the IUD Retreads, which lasted, was very short-lived. Everybody would start a band. It didn't matter who you were or if you could play your instruments. She starts playing, she was, she was raised on country music and bluegrass. So she starts playing me Hazel Dickens, like Hazel and Alice, Stanley Brothers. And I thought, damn, I mean, this stuff has a higher kill ratio than anything Nick Cave ever came up with. This is pretty cool stuff. And now, in just a moment, you get to meet the people that play all these instruments here. One of the best bluegrass bands in the country. I guess you know what bluegrass is. It's folk music with overdrive. And it's been better if we had we never. And that's why we can love them on men. For the pleasure we all had together. Let us try love and learn to forget. Dead Babies and Jesus and, you know, Throw Molly Off the Mountain and Sitting in My Cell Waiting to Die kind of music. And Tom was amazed by it because he had never really gotten into it that deeply as he did with me. And we started to go to bluegrass festivals and, I mean, these guys, someone like Ralph Stanley, Bill Monroe, Del McCoury, I mean, we saw Jimmy Martin. Um, they could play faster than any punk rocker. Stephanie and I started a bluegrass band, The Deliberate Strangers.
at a club called the Horseshoe down on the south side and they started having bluegrass open stage and so we decided to put a band together and uh, I'm not sure how this all happened but I ended up playing bass and I just remember saying I think I could play bass and we went to a music store and I picked up a bass and I started to play with it and I said yeah I think I could do this and so I started playing bass with Tom and I was self-taught on the bass I'm the laziest bass player in Pittsburgh I think or the world <laughs> when I started writing songs, like truly writing songs, doing original songs, which was very different from what the uh, other bluegrass bands were doing. The other things we were doing different, we played extremely fast. Somebody described us like a machine. That band is like a machine. I sweating like a Sunday preacher, turned into a blood hard creature, got my boot post over my heart. Much drunk and I ain't quitting, standing up won't catch me sitting last of all you poor hogs and turn you into large. All it while it be fighting mad, brought up and bone breaking bad. Too late now, lost my senses, kicking hard, jumping face to hold, while they be fighting mad. Than a cornered poke it better than a rabbit won't bad biggies than what you ever seen. That's what child I'm seeing double really didn't want to trouble too much be cordial and not a being mean. Hard one it big bad man Right up and bone breaking bad Too late now lost my senses kicking hard jumping fence and hard one and big bad man we had a drummer. We'd have percussion and a drummer. And um, some of the people involved in that scene said that we weren't doing bluegrass. And uh, so we just said, screw that and just kept doing more of what we're doing. We recorded four CDs together. I learned a whole lot. I learned a whole lot about songwriting and I really loved that period of time. And we saw a lot of good acts. We, we toured, we played in St. Louis at Twang Fest. We uh, did a tour of West Virginia, the Outlaw Writers Tour. We toured with two famous writers uh, from West Virginia. Chuck Kinder and Lee Maynard. Uh, it was really an opportunity. So I look back at those years and I, I see them as, as very rich and very good. What is life for a miner's wife? Married young and widowed twice. Weary hard and tired, watch the light. Yeah, Doc Boggs. Um, interestingly, uh, when he was born, the doctor that delivered him, his last name was Moran. It was Dr. Moran. Hence, his, and it was apparently a difficult birth. And so he was named 
Moran Boggs, of all things. Um, hence the name Doc Boggs. And uh, he had a penchant for playing very depressing songs like Oh Death. Our children prayed, the preachers preached, how mercy is that you read. And back in the day, he was doing a performance, and someone yelled to him, Hey, Doc, get out of the graveyard. And here we are. On the second Deliberate Strangers um, CD, uh, we ended it with an old traditional Appalachian song, Satan, Your Kingdom Must Come Down. And I was playing claw hammer banjo on it and scratchy. Our uh, fiddle player was playing synthesizer on it, so it had this drone going on it. And the magazine at the time reviewed it and said it sounded like Neil Young meets Throbbing Gristle, which I always loved, you know. But yeah, it's an old song, and thinking about it, it's sort of apt for these times. It just goes, Satan, your kingdom must come down. Satan, your kingdom must come down. I heard the voice of Jesus say, Satan, your kingdom must come down. Shout till I tear your kingdom down, kingdom down. Shout till I tear your kingdom down. I heard the voice of Jesus say, Satan, your kingdom must come down. Pray till I tear your kingdom down, kingdom down. Pray till I tear your kingdom down. I heard the voice of Jesus say, Satan, your kingdom must come down. how the whole thing sort of started with the weird, you know, off um, culture stuff, which was sort of like actually how the whole thing sort of started off with like born again banjos, where I'd get like banjos at a flea market. And then I first started just doing inlay and a really traditional banjo neck inlay would be um, you see that on like Mother of Pearl or something uh, it's called the Tree of Life but of course me I had to do the Tree of Death with the crows and the albino snake and uh, the skull at the bottom And this is one of my, my first inlay jobs. Oh, I think this one came next. Cigar box instrument, um, which I really was an experiment in. Uh, um, building a compound neck. Which I hadn't actually built a compound neck. There's like one, two, three, four, five pieces of wood on it. Um, so I sort of wanted to do something to, to like learn that process of how, how you actually go about building a neck. And of course, it has a trap door.
He's not getting attention. He's causing problems. Look. You're Look, you're busted. on camera. You're busted. You're on film. I got you. Brett, this will you be know used later. This will be used later. This will be reviewed by the authorities. The infamous ant liar. No hoofed ones were ever hurt in the building of this instrument. Um, shed antler. Um, this was primarily a, a bending, a bending project. Um, I hadn't started bending stuff in the same manner as I would for an oud, so I um, was just sort of taking things as it were, and uh, it has uh, auto harp tuners, which you need a wrench to do. Of course, yeah, I mean, it's fairly, fairly, fairly limited as to what it can do. However, it gets more interesting once you plug it in. Um, as it does have stereo piezo pickups in it. Where I can run run it into two separate amplifiers or two different delays or looping effects and stuff, and I have used it publicly in in that context. <laughs> Basically, I followed the money trail back from banjos, back to West Africa, up through the Sahara, and I ended up at the Oud. In order to build Ouds, I had to make a lot of friends on the other side of the planet, but that time it's like 2007. Um, the folks on the other side of the planet were a little bit distrustful of my motives, but once they uh, figured things out that I was okay, um, People were so wonderful and people helped me. Uh, this little song is based on some traditional farmer songs and there are two different melodies and two different rhythms uh, attached to each other to give you a whole picture of a new Nubian song. <laughs> Thank you. 
important musical instrument throughout the Middle East is the oud. The oud belongs to the lute family of instruments and is played with a feather from an eagle. On the oud, it is possible to play notes that are very close together. It is also possible to slide from one note to another. American music it's very very different and he basically learned from the internet and taught himself and he is a brilliant player I love listening to the oud I mean my life continued with this music around and with listening to him practice and just really enjoying it and as he would become interested in music he would turn me on to the different kinds and styles of music I grew up listening to Led Zeppelin and the Rolling Stones. I'm never going to play Middle Eastern or Indian classical music perfectly. It's always going to be this mixed up thing. I feel Reese's Cup ad. Hey, you got your peanut butter in my chocolate. You got your chocolate in my peanut butter. That's what's going to happen. You must approach the music of different cultures, and this is like the most important thing, with respect, and try to understand um, where they're coming from. When I started building nudes, um, my joke is, yeah, most of my friends on Facebook, their names begin with A or M, and folks on the other side of the world, from Turkey, from Lebanon, Syria, um, from Egypt, um, Tunisia, Algeria, um, they taught me how to build these things. Um, they were, the first word that I learned in Arabic was shukran, which means thank you. Next word I learned is F1, which is you're welcome.
song for me had to have lyrics. To listen to an instrumental was like, I don't know how you do this, you know. Um, and I started listening to instrumentals and finding the complexity in them. <laughs> sitar be at my house in a half an hour so I said yeah that sounds interesting <laughs> Indian theory. Um, now, I'm a guy with one four five tattooed on his arm. I played punk rock and hillbilly music for years and years and years. Now, one four five compared to classical Indian or Middle Eastern music is just right off the table. It's gone. It doesn't matter. Um, so now I've been playing those forms for so long that I think in terms of these really long extended pieces. I think in terms of um, it's nothing like a song coming in at like 40 minutes. So when I'm playing at, uh, at the tea house for my usual spot there, which I've been kindly allowed to have I can sit down and play for like 40 minutes straight um, as opposed to like a three minute song you know with in it 
140 beats per minute. Um, so now that that's not, now that feels really alien to me.
so you you mentioned about how a lot of this um, uh, getting into playing and, and getting into a future as a musician um, starting a lot with learning other people's music uh, whereas today I think a lot of bands in Pittsburgh are, are starting out saying we want to start out exclusively playing original music and then let's tack on two covers at, at the end of the show. We started off with a certain skill set you know and I mean it's starting back in late 60s, early 70s, um, there wasn't such a big deal about doing original stuff. Um, we're garage bands. You know, Creedence, Cream, Zeppelin, and stuff. But then once you started getting into, like, quote-unquote, prog rock stuff, um, everything became chops not songs mm -hmm. um and obviously you're not gonna have you know at age 13 you're not gonna have the chops there um so really writing your own stuff sort of came later all in one fell swoop with punk rock came along. I remember um, we read about it. We would get New Musical Express and all the British papers and stuff. We were reading about this and um, of course we knew Alice Cooper. We knew the Stooges. Mm -hmm. Beginning. Yeah, we're, we're reading about this stuff that's going on in, in England, Sex Pistols and stuff. And then I remember first hearing the Ramones. I was really disappointed. <laughs> it, was, it was like, well, there's no guitar so The songs are like three minutes long and there's no guitar solos. <laughs> but then a friend of mine, uh, his brother lived in New York City and would uh and had this roommate named Dave and they would sort of supply my 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 young friend with uh 45s and like independent release and he played um television's little Johnny Jewel single mm -hmm. for me and it just blew my mind <laughs> it was just like these discordant solos and something it's like wow there's something to this mm -hmm. and it grew from it grew from there. I was initially really disappointed with the Sex Pistols. I said, well, "This is just Chuck Berry, but faster." <laughs> you know, there's really you know, it's it's still, you know, it's still three chords. It's you know, one four five. It's still there, you know. And I initially thought punk rock was going to sound like what eventually turned up in the no New York stuff like mm. the contortion right. and Teenage Jesus. And in Pittsburgh it was sort of like we, we would say there was like little there were like little independent campfires of it. And we all started meeting up, going to to uh, Jim's records and stuff. And then it didn't matter if you had chops. It didn't matter if you could play your instrument. Um, you want, at that point, you wanted to write your own songs. And that's where that came in. And that's where covers, you could do covers, but with a massive dose of irony. <laughs> of course. You know, massive dose of irony. <laughs>
I think if we just fade that, that would be good. What kind of energy are they putting out, getting from you and putting out, and you're exchanging this energy and both feeding off of each other for this amount of time? To me, that's at this point in my life is like would be like the ideal performance situation. Um, that's the way it is playing like with um, live music yoga. You're actually feeding off the people's energy and then you're putting back out and this loop cr gets created. Um, I suppose that happened, that happens in all the time, and I mean it certainly happened in, in, in punk rock, you know, he had this energy thing, it, it was just, Well that's the connection, house. that's yeah. the connection, though. That's, right. why you're, that's why you're doing, it's an evolution of, of what you've done, a reincarnation, but that's that common thread, and that's, right. that's, what, that's why it makes sense. You know that's why it make that's why it's not just how did he get from you know punk to bluegrass to, to yeah. yourself after every so often completely reinvent yourself and I found it's been a very good philosophy you know I'm on about a fifth incarnation now it's you know people because uh, that was a funny thing when I released mood music for snake handlers or oud music for snake handlers, rather. Say I get mixed up. Um, people said to me that, oh, your music is so relaxing and therapeutic. And I said, I'm sorry. I didn't mean for that to happen. And they were like, no, I really mean it. And I thought, I sort of meant for this to be really twitchy. You know, I sort of wanted to get the stuff to get under your skin and make you twitch a little bit, you know.
got real mixed up. It was like one of those, you know, I went from Ike to Ravi. Um, quite a leap. Quite a leap indeed. Um, I think I made a good choice. Thank mm -hmm. you. 